Hey everybody, if you enjoy the podcast and the content it provides, be sure to hop over and check out the community. The community is an exclusive members website that is just an extension of what we do here in July at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar. What it is, is a combination of video lectures, a coach's corner with your Monday morning take-home information, and a forum where you can talk about anything and everything related to the field of strength and conditioning. In the community, you'll find content added each month from some of the top practitioners in the world, ranging from PhDs to high-level coaches, bringing you exactly what they're doing with their athletes or their research at the present moment. On top of that, an additional discussion by coaches bringing you that Monday morning information, things that you can add to your training program right away. Tying that in with the opportunity to discuss with coaches around the world in the forum on anything and everything from the topics addressed in these presentations to whatever you're seeing in your daily life as a coach. If this sounds like the right thing for you and your staff, go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and try it out for 48 hours for just a dollar. If you like it, you're signed up, ready to roll, and you're jumping into all the great content added each month. If not, feel free to go ahead and cancel at any time. No questions asked. We're really excited about what we're building in the community and hope you are too. Go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and check it out today. All right, welcome to today's podcast here at www.cvasps.com. Uh, today we have Danny Ramondi here, and we're going to talk about his latest article a bit, an article review, a look at post-activation potentiation. Danny, thank you very much for uh, being with us today. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure. Awesome. Well, first, before we even get started, let me thank, on behalf of myself and everybody that reads the article, all the work that you've put in and all the help you've done, it, it, it's been great. Um, but Appreciate let's that, get Jay. right Appreciate into it here. Let's get right into this here. Post-activation potentiation is, is not just a topic that everybody throws around every day. Why uh, Why did you pick this? Well, um, it's a pretty cool topic, I think. Uh, you know, you hear a lot about it uh, in different forms. I remember first reading about it with uh, – Charles Poliquin and actually Dan John, although he probably didn't didn't term it that way. Um, Poliquin, the one to six method originally, uh, he called it post titanic facilitation or potentiation, um, which I always thought was pretty cool because I actually used it a little bit myself. And you know, granted, I was uh, a low level athlete when I first started using it, and I still am, for, you know, not that qualified in terms of a, a power lifter. But I, I used it when I was kind of starting out, and I got really good results. And I was always kind of intrigued by this weird little phenomenon that goes on. So it's always been kind of an interesting subject, I think, just the nature of how the nervous system is almost being potentiated or, or facilitated um, by by certain loads. Uh, Dan John talked a little bit about it when he mentioned the uh, the famous Litvinov workouts, which was uh, you know squat front squat heavyweight, which was the old uh, the old hammer thrower Sergey Litvinov did the uh, the front squats with I think 405, and would then go run 400 meter sprints. So it basically came down to, you know, squat a heavy weight, run a sprint. And, uh, you know, while, while it seems kind of, the science is a little murky, it's, it has a result that just seems to work, you know. And uh, so when I saw this article, this, this article in the, the Journal of uh, Strength and Conditioning Research, I was pretty intrigued because um, most people, like I said, they most, mostly look at almost like a complex type setup where they do a high load uh, movement and then measure a... Uh, some some type of effect on it, like a, a jump or something. Whereas this uh, study looked at the exact the opposite. So we looked at the effect of a low load, high velocity movement. In this case, the depth jump, and how it will affect maximal strength. Um, so while it's not the first of its kind, like we we usually talk about in warm up, doing something to help uh, to help activate the nervous system, it, it adds a little more you know a little more fuel to what we're saying, uh, a little more a little evidence, uh, so to speak, so that we can really go into our warm-ups knowing fully that these activation exercises, these jumps, um, anything of that nature is actually having a good effect on our, on our workouts for that day. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great stuff, man. And, you know, seeing kind of how you started training and everything back when you were with us at Richmond, um, yep. Yep. Definitely have 
firsthand knowledge of, of how you were toying around with that. Yep. So let's get into what uh, Bullock and Comfort had to say about it. Let's let's dive into the study and let, let's talk a little bit here about what we can actually take from this and what we can actually, you know, interpret this for when it comes to preparing our athletes. Okay, so the study took 14, 14 male athletes. Um, I'll just give a little rehab, re- rehash here. 14 male athletes, they tested their, their maximal strength, their maximal strength via a back squat. Um, and the way they tested it was they uh, had some subjects perform either two jumps, some performed four, or some performed six jumps, six depth jumps, that is, from a 12-inch box. Um, they they uh, accounted for the knee bend in the squat. They accounted for arm swing in the depth jump. And they essentially just measured what type of strength increases they would see by performing these jumps. Um, and with, I think it was a three-day rest in between. Uh, and they found that between the two, four, and six, there's really no inter-variation between the different uh, repetition variables. But they found significant results on subsequent strength gains um, among the athletes. Now, I think what's most interesting in this study is the tendency for the stronger athletes, those who could squat double body weight, I think the the interesting thing is that their tendency with the six jumps was a greater trend towards uh, an improvement in strength. And this is really essentially just just really solidifying what we kind of know is that depth jumps require a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of I guess, training experience, you'd say, um, require a lot of strength. And the stronger athlete, the one who's able to withstand that force of the fall, is going to be able to on the return, jump much higher and potentiate his nervous system that much more, get that much more of a return, more, more bang for your buck from the exercise. That's not to say that the lower-level athletes um, didn't get any results from it because the study indicates that they did. It's just not as much as the advanced athletes. Um, I always talk about, I guess, one of the, one of the coolest things I've had the, the privilege of doing since uh, in starting my master's and finishing it is really kind of looking at more research and uh, so you always got to, I guess, look at the, the limitations of the article, which I had never really looked at before. And I think in this article, one of the biggest limitations that you would look at, for me at least, was the way they performed the jumps. And this, and when I was reading this, I just kept hearing Dr. Yes in my head the whole time, um, and technique, technique, technique. And the jumps, while it's good for research to account for arm swing, it's not necessarily good for performance because the jumps were done with your hands on your hips, which if we ever – jump, you're always going to use an arm swing or a pre-stretch to help get some, out of, get some more out of it. And it's great for research, but like I said, performance-wise, you're always going to want to jump as high as you possibly can, and that's going to involve an arm swing. Um, so that, 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 to me, was one of the biggest limitations of the article. Um, ultimately, though, I, I think what's really good to take away from it is with higher-level athletes performing any type of explosive movement whether it be a depth jump, um, a drop squat jump, some type of uh, maybe a, a broad jump, they're going to have a positive effect on, and if you allow for around three or four minutes, it's going to have a positive effect on that, that subsequent strength uh, exercise you do. So it doesn't necessarily also apply to a squat. You could do, for example, uh, a plyometric push-up, like a clap push-up. Um, I know from my personal experience, a lot of times from uh, competing in a, in a, in a piloting meet, um, if I know I'm going on in about two minutes to uh, to take my attempt at the bench, I I like to perform a, a clap push up or a like a plyo push up. I kind of feel like it amps me up a little bit more. Um, so yeah, anything of anything explosive prior to it, give it in about two three minutes of rest, and you'll probably get some pretty good carryover uh, neurally to the strength exercise. Um, yep. No, that's fantastic. It, the other thing that I think that it it helps, you know, and, and you touched upon it when looking at, you know, depth jumps, if you're performing them for volume, um, requiring priority, I, I think that really what it shows is that looking at the means that you're selecting and determining where the priority should be, personally, I, I would always put the explosive movements as the priority, yeah. because as we know, you know, 
speed is the determining no factor. Yeah, right, and no, no, no question about it. And as um, you know, like like you said, you want to understand, you know, really the context in which you're going to apply it, this stress. And if you're, you're going to take something very stressful, like a depth jump, you know, make it, make sure you're applying it to an advanced athlete, someone who's really going to be able to capitalize on all the benefits this this exercise, this, this method can do. Um, I, had a, I had a really good teacher here at the university. He was John, named John Fitzgerald. He's um, He's getting his PhD right now. He's a, a, a he researches a lot of vitamin D and, and testosterone, but he's also um, a student of the former Eastern Bloc countries in their literature. And you know, we were talking about depth jumps one day, and he said this is really it's almost like your ace card. It's like showing your ace card. It's it's what, when you're going to play it. You know, do you want to show it when athletes like a low level, um, untrained person? Who, you know, they'll get some, they'll probably get some benefits out of it. You know, they may get injured depending on how really how weak they are. But if, you know, just would you do you want them to to be exposed to it really early on so that later on they don't get as much of a benefit from it, or do you kind of want to wait until they're fully ready to take advantage of the the depth jump and it does everything it could possibly do for you? So it's kind of like when you want to play, when you want to show your hand. Um, personally, I prefer to show it when they're you know, ready to take advantage of it. We have some throwers here at the U, for example, um, and they're all perfectly, perfectly strong and really able to fully capitalize on the exercise when they're doing it, whereas we get some athletes that come in here that are very weak, and you can kind of tell when they when they fall off the box and when they hit the ground, you get that that almost that bending, that, that yielding in the knee where they can't actually withstand the force, that downward force. So the real strong athletes, the accomplished ones, when, you, when they hit that ground, their body just hits like a statue. It's just perfectly still. The force is perfectly able to be redirected upwards towards, uh, you know, we actually have them depth jump onto another box. It's kind of a cool way for them to get as high as they possibly can. Um, but it's it's a good way for it's for determining who's kind of running and who's not. You know, if the athlete hits and their their joints are sagging when they hit, they're not sticking the landing, you know it's probably not something they're ready for. Um, and like you said, prioritizing it. If, it's, if you're at a point in your training where you're you're trying to finalize um, speed, strength, explosive, explosiveness, you want to give them, you know, plenty of rest in between depth jumps, like Yuri Vershansky said. Um, give them plenty of rest in between the series. Give them plenty of rest in between the jumps. You know, you want this to be high-quality, high-velocity movements and Teaching it, you know, taking it and putting it into like a conditioning variable, that's that's not going to do any good for anybody. Um, you know, use it use it as you need it and understand how the stress is going to really affect the body. Yeah, you know, and I think, too, that, you know, to kind of piggyback that and showing, you know, as you said, your ace card or, or maybe even your, your trump card would be even better. Yeah. yeah. Um, to, to take... You know, even while you're in your GPP phase and looking at progressions to get towards the depth jump, you know, what can you do to help assist these athletes to get to that situation? You know, I, I don't know if it was Yuri or Natalia, which, whichever one, it was either her article on the site or in um, Special Strength Training, a manual for coaches, where mm. there's actually a progression for how to get to depth jumps. I mean, and, and that's almost you know, give it to you on a platter where you start the kids at the lower end that are in the lower end and they get good at those. But you're also looking at it here as you're potentiating the athlete. So therefore, not only are they getting better at an exercise to get to the final goal, which would be to perform, you know, multiple depth jumps at high quality and high volume, but also you're improving their ability to perform in the weight room with the strength exercises, which are also, therefore, increasing their ability to get to the point to be able to do depth jumps. And I yep. think that that's oh, yeah. where this is really, like, super cool, is that it shows, yep. like you said, that we're right, that doing these things and programming it properly and putting it in and getting them ready, I mean, then let's just use the squat, setting them up so they're ready to squat better so that they can improve more upon it so that they're more ready strength-wise for the depth jump, but also they're ready movement-wise 
because you're going through the proper channels of progression. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, one thing that can be taken away is, is you know, if you have a low-level athlete, maybe the study, the study use a depth jump, but you don't necessarily have to use a depth jump. You may use a, a drop squat jump, which is a little more intensive than a squat, just a regular squat jump, which, you know, Coach Dietz has um, talked about before. Or maybe you use something simple if it's, if it's a real young athlete. Maybe you do a couple pogos or tuck jumps, something that it's not going to break them down like a like a fall from the 24-inch box might, like a depth jump if you're doing it. But it's, it's at the same time going to still get those good benefits and help, like you said, facilitate that subsequent strength exercise. Um, really going to, which, which, if, you know, maybe doing during GPP phase, that's going to set a really good foundation for what we're trying to accomplish later on with our, with our specialized exercises. Right. Well, yeah. and it's about, you know, the, people want to term it like minimal minimalist programming now and I'm sure Doc is going to hear this and shake his head and Yosef is going to shake <laughs> his head because they've been talking about this for up to years yeah. give them the least amount that they need you know and, and let them adapt and, and then start to push them and it's it, I don't know why now all of a sudden it needs a catchphrase but I mean in the profession we're in everything needs a cool phrase yeah um but speaking of the profession we're in and improving performance and, and finding the next thing, um, in at least one of the articles you've written, you've talked about things that you're, it may have just been your Q&A, but talked about what you're looking at now and as, as far as continuing education and, and things of that nature. Um, and people have asked, so what is Danny looking at now and what do you see looking at in the future, whether it be books, research, um, or even yeah. names, like people you're you're looking into to see what they're doing. Okay, yeah, definitely. Um so so right now it was actually a bit of a, a hectic past three or four weeks for me. I uh I was recently hired um full time at a new hockey facility out here in the in Minnesota. So I, I started full time work and unfortunately I kinda coincided with when my my final semester of my master's was finishing up so it was a little, a little tough trying to get some some good reading on the outside in, but um, finished up. So I just finished up my master's program, um, and right now we've, we've actually we just got out of a meeting. Me, Coach Dietz, um, several of our assistants, um, and one of our PhD students. What we what we try to do is we'll pick basically a textbook and go through a chapter by chapter, discuss ideas, kind of throw around what they they might be talking about, how we might apply it to our training. You know, essentially, what have we missed? We, we, most of us have read, read the textbooks before, but what have we really missed? And we put all these minds together. What can we come up with? So this week, what we're doing is um, Fundamentals of Sports Training by Medvedev. Um, and we're actually, I guess one of the, one of the buzzwords, I think one of the names right now that's really big um, is Joel Jameson. Um, I know I've been really, learned, I've really learned a lot about energy systems and how to think about it from from him, Landon Evans, uh, James Smith, um, and although to a lesser extent, Val Nazkin. Um, so those are some names that I think are really, really big right now in the uh, in our industry, in our in our field, um, because, because as simply as it is, those guys get great results. Um, they understand the process of training. Um, they're able to incorporate current research and the previous stuff, um, including all the USSR studies and all that stuff. So they're able to really blend together a lot of the different um, fields and come up with some pretty, uh, I guess Mark McLaughlin would be in that too, um, that list. So, yeah, for right now what we're doing is we're looking at fundamentals of sports training um, uh, and just basically how we can fit that into our in one of our in one of our models, which is the triphasic undulating block method. Um, so we kind of see how we might take some of you know Jameson's methods, some of what Mudvayev talks about, and how do we look at our system and how this can maybe apply to it? How can it fit in um, into what we do here at the U? And 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 that's kind of a broad talk, but you know, for specifically hockey players maybe, or for our throwers, because each person. Each team has a different program. Each person on the team has uh, a somewhat unique program. 
So it's um, how can we apply this to each program, and each type of athlete? Just you know what we do for what we the way we set up our our the way we set up our our micro cycles and macro, et cetera. For a hockey player, it's going to look terribly different for our shot players. Um, and the same with with foot golfer or something, you know. So we're always just kind of looking back. We'll, we'll do the same same thing with like super training, science and practice. Um, it's really good, and, you know. It's it's it's, a, it's awesome to always look at new research and new materials that are coming out. But I forget who forget who wrote it once, but look back honestly at the, the kind of the core books that that got you where you are. Things like starting strength and super training and science of practice, the kind of the core fundamental texts of our field, and get really good at those ones too. I mean, everybody wants to read all the new books and all the new research, and there's value to that, but you can't, you always, always go back to and remember that the principles exist for a reason and that they're important for a reason. And you always got to really master those before you can get to the more uh, difficult, advanced stuff and just kind of understand the foundation of of training methodology is, is huge. Well, Danny, that's awesome for two reasons, because you just named a list of people uh, other than Mark McLaughlin and, uh, and Matt Viev who are going to be at the 2012 seminar. So right. that's a, a big yeah. time, cheap little plug um, <laughs> for the people listening that aren't a member of the, of the newsletter yet. Sign up now. Uh, it's the only way you'll be able to get the discount rate of $100 up until about the middle of the month. Danny, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to uh, sit down and talk with us and go over this. I, I really appreciate it. You did a heck of a job. Buddy. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Jay. It was a pleasure.